You're listening to the Hour of the Time. I'm William Cooper, and we're going to go straight down to Phoenix for tonight's metal report. Good evening, Gene. Good evening, Bill. How are you doing? Fine. Doing better than the stock market, I'll imagine. Oh, well, I warned everybody, didn't I? Yeah, we've been warning them for a while here. Well, let's take a look at what's happening here. Today, gold had a high of 386.90, a low of 383.10, to close at uh, 384.90. Up 50 cents. Uh, silver had a high of 557, a low of 541 to close at $5.50, down 4 cents. Uh, platinum did 450, had a high of 415, a low of 401.50 to close at 412.70, up $2.30. And the mighty Dow had, had a high of 36.9550. 30, at a low of 36.56.10 to close at 36.79.70, up $4.30. Uh, so far to date, we've lost a little over from the high in the stock market, which was uh, early part of this year. We've lost over 300 points in the stock market. And to put it in uh, real terms that people can understand, that is a loss of over $300 billion that is just basically, poof, gone up in smoke or it's in somebody's pocket, certainly not the investors at this point. And like you said, uh, we tried to tell them, uh, last year alone, $1.5 trillion was pumped into the stock market, which I believe was like $32 billion more than the record year that happened in 92. And this was by and large people that had taken money out of their savings accounts, their CDs, and they were literally forced by the Federal Reserve into the stock market, which was highly speculative, highly risky, very over much, very overvalued. And then all of a sudden, boom, it dries up, the rugs pulled out from under them, and then billions and billions of dollars are lost. And during this time, gold and silver just held in there very, very steady. It maybe moved up or down one or two percent during this. Uh, during this major uh, decline that's lost nearly uh, 10% of its value. I guess I wonder which one I would rather have my money in, uh, something that's been fluctuating within 1% or something that's lost over, you know, nearly 10% of its value. Are you asking me? Sure, I'm <laughs> asking you. Well, you know where I put my money. I put my money into real things that are going to hold value. The stock market is, uh, well, it's a scam anyway. It's like going to Las Vegas and rolling dice on a crap table. If you're not a large uh, investor with uh, hundreds of millions of dollars behind you, then uh, you're just, uh, you're like a fly. <laughs> Basically legalized gambling. That's right. And uh, you're highly at risk. Folks, we got some information. We have a brand new newsletter just came out this last week. Uh, call to get it. It's free. It's, it's, it's some great information about what's happening in the markets, uh, what's happening in the gold and silver markets, uh, uh, what's happening in the numismatic market and the junk silver and so on and so forth. We'd be more than happy to get it out to you. But don't become just an information junkie. Uh, do something with this information. Put it to good use. Uh, uh, do something constructive with it and, and uh, do something that ultimately down the road you're going to be able to survive with. Uh, when it comes time to it, uh, I guess you got to ask yourself, if I take all those stock certificates into the grocery store, if I take some junk silver or, or gold into the grocery store, which one is that guy going to take and, and how, how, which one am I going to be able to feed my family with and, and survive with? I guess the answer becomes real simple when we bring it down to basic terms. And uh, Let us help you out. Give us a call, 
289-2646. That's again, 1-800-289-2646. Give us a call. We'll get some information out to you, and uh, let's get you educated, and let's get you, let's get you started in protecting your families. Thank you, Gene. Thank you, Bill. Have a good evening. We'll see you next week. All right, sir. Okay, folks, you heard it. Call now, 1-800-289-2646. That's 1-800-289-2646. Mention my name. Get all the newsletters and free literature that you're entitled to as a listener to the Hour of the Time. And while you're at it, thank them for sponsoring this program. You know, something. some people just don't understand. They don't get the message. I've been getting a lot of calls from convicted felons lately taking me to task because I told them, or I told the world, that they should not allow convicted felons in their militia units. And that is absolutely correct, and I stand by it. Folks, we have to get the public on our sides. The public must be able to look at the militia units and not be afraid of them. They must understand that the militia is there to protect the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. If they see a bunch of convicted felons, no matter how innocent they claim they were, no matter how innocent the crimes they claim they were convicted were, it doesn't matter. It's the public perception that counts. One fellow called me up and objected, and when I stuck to my guns and told him that that's exactly what I believe, and that's exactly what I'm going to put out to the world, and that's exactly what I'm going to recommend to militia units when they contact me, He began to call me back and proved, proved that I am correct when I say that. Because he turned in to what he was, a convicted felon, began making threats, began making a complete ass out of himself, and is probably, no doubt, going to continue. But remember, folks, when you do that, If you do that, we tape all those calls, and they're always turned over to the local sheriff, and one copy is always sent to the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Step right up, ladies and gentlemen, to the Whitewater Carnival. Get your tickets one thin dime. Step right up. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Here's your change. Step right in. In the tent. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. All your questions will be answered inside. See the Bellaries, the only Chinese presidency in the history of the United States. See the documents that convicted them of treason and criminal activity that resulted in the impeachment of Bellaries. The presidency is coming down. White Rider is king. Step right up, folks. Right in to the tent. Take a seat. See the hoochie coochie dancers of the Billy Cabinet. Folks, tonight's program comes to you from a report by Nick Guarino from. Uh, Information collected by CADGI members, from my research, and from the research of many other people. Bill Clinton is the greatest criminal ever to occupy the White House. Nixon's crimes were those of a truant schoolboy compared to what Clinton has pulled off. Right now, Bill Clinton is being investigated for possible criminal bank fraud, for possible election fraud, and for obstruction of justice for events surrounding the possible murder of his own Deputy White House Counsel, Vincent Foster. Clinton has also been served with a subpoena requesting his documents in a criminal matter other than Whitewater Connections. A special, a special grand jury has now been convened in Little Rock, Arkansas for a criminal indictment of Bill Clinton and a number of his cronies for Whitewater, the looting of Madison Guarantee Savings and Loan, and illegal small business administrative loans. Federal Judge Stephen Reasoner said that a compelling case for the need for a special grand jury was presented to him, and this is the first time in American history any president has ever faced a grand jury. (laughs) The research of Nick Guarino and many others and personal knowledge indicate that these investigations have only begun to scratch the surface of the corruption and larceny that has characterized Clinton's political career. 
based on the thousands of pages of documents that I've studied and the witnesses I've spoken to, I believe Bill Clinton is guilty of extortion and racketeering. It's common knowledge among businessmen in Arkansas that politics in their state is based upon a system of shakedowns. Some examples. Dan Lassiter was a big Clinton campaign contributor. He got the lucrative bond contracts despite the horrendous reputation of his firm and despite his known connections to drug dealers. James McDougall diverted funds from his SNL to pay off Clinton's debts and finance his political ambitions. In turn, he was protected from the regulators. Seth Ward was a director of the SNL that gave huge loans to Clinton and his cronies. He was awarded a 2.7 million bond issue for his Park on Meter Incorporated. Bank fraud. Using Whitewater and other real estate schemes, Clinton and his cronies looted millions from at least one savings and loan in the Small Business Administration. Clinton also used his political power as governor of Arkansas to prevent state regulators from closing the SNL until four years after it had essentially become insolvent. Another SNL in almost identical shape was slammed out immediately. The result was the heaviest percentage loss of any savings and loan in the United States. Campaign fraud. Documents that Nick Guarino and others have seen indicate that Clinton has lied about his campaign donations, lied about diversions of funds of his campaign accounts from SBA loans taken out by his cronies and never repaid. Suppressed criminal referrals that were waiting for him at the United States Attorney's Office in Little Rock while he ran for president and used funds that were looted from an SNL and the SBA to finance his campaign. Tampering with federal witnesses. James McDougall has said publicly that he could sink the Clinton's Whitewater claims, quote, quicker than they could lie about it if I could get in a position so I wouldn't have my head beaten off, unquote. Many witnesses appear to have been paid off in the form of cushy jobs with high salaries or lucrative government deals. One, Vince Foster, has turned up mysteriously dead. Others have turned up dead. In fact, over 28 people closely connected to William Clinton are now dead, ladies and gentlemen. Many have been beaten, threatened, arrested, thrown in jail on trumped-up charges. Destroying documents requested in a criminal investigation. There have been over 80 subpoenas for documents surrounding Whitewater and Clinton. Many documents from Whitewater are missing entirely. Bill and Hillary's partners, the McDougals, claim they hand-delivered all the paperwork to the Clintons. Bill and Hillary, or Billery, say they never received it. Checks are gone, disappeared. Deeds are gone, disappeared, loan payments, their sources and their recipients have been obscured. And it has just come out that Whitewater documents have been shredded at the Rose Law Firm where Hillary worked. At least nine criminal prosecutions recommended by the RTC were once turned down because the missing documents made the case too difficult to prove. Obstructing justice, Clinton refused to cooperate with banking officials in their investigation of Whitewater and the savings and loan that financed it, Madison Guarantee. Then he negotiated a special subpoena for himself with his hand-picked Attorney General, Janet Reno, the mastermind of the massacre at Waco, that put the documents in the protective custody of the Justice Department where no other regulatory agency, let alone the public, is permitted to see them. This is an outrage. Bribing public officials. Evidence shows that officials who cooperated with Clinton in allowing his schemes to continue were repeatedly rewarded with appointments and other special favors. He also used his political power to keep people who had damaging information quiet, to shut them up. Even the police were paid off to provide him with special services and to keep their mouths shut about what those special services were. Accessory to murder. Nick Guarino, myself, William Cooper, and many others are convinced that Deputy White House Counsel Vince Foster was murdered because he knew too much about Whitewater and the other bank and real estate scams. On top of this, it appears that he was having an affair with Hillary Clinton. 
While his death has been covered up as a suicide, the physical evidence at the crime scene directly contradicts that conclusion. The Clintons and their associates have interfered with the police investigation of Foster's death and have tampered with the evidence. And Hillary has all along been a key player. Hillary was not, ladies and gentlemen, at home baking chocolate chip cookies while Bill committed all the crimes. She was an essential co-conspirator. Through her law firm, under the shield of attorney-client privilege, she committed extraordinary breaches of ethics to protect Clinton and his cronies from the bank regulators. She was intimately involved in Whitewater, intimately, deeply involved in Whitewater. She concocted a fraudulent scheme to keep Madison Guarantee open while Clinton and his cronies continued to loot millions from the deposits. And while on hire by the government, she conducted secret out-of-court settlements that protected the Clinton cronies and cost the American taxpayers hundreds of millions, possibly billions of dollars. Clinton already is the first president in American history to have a criminal referral, the last step before an indictment mentioning him personally. Representative James Leach confirmed that this criminal referral was issued. He also confirmed that it has never been made public by the government. The entire investigation is being stonewalled by Clinton and his appointees in the Justice Department and specifically the mastermind of the massacre at Waco, Texas, Janet Reno. Clinton has surrounded himself by loyal co-conspirators who are willing to do anything to protect him. Anything. And where have we heard that before? Oh, I'm only following orders. Nearly every key position in Washington is now staffed by Clinton appointees. This includes the top people at the Justice Department, the temporary head of the RTC, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, and scores of subordinate bureaucrats and the regulatory agencies. These are the very people who should be upholding justice and stood there helping him cover up his crimes, and over 95% of them can be proven Marxists, socialists, globalists. Many of these same Clinton appointees lied to you about Clinton's past. During the 1992 campaign for president, a criminal referral for Clinton had already been waiting process in Arkansas. Clinton's friends in Little Rock suppressed it. If this fact had been made public, Clinton's campaign would have come to a screeching halt. Who was his partner in suppressing all of this information? Not just this, but all of it. The press, ladies and gentlemen. Gary Hart was guilty of having his picture taken next to a beautiful woman on a fishing boat, and all hopes of his reaching the presidency was destroyed as the press published that photograph and made accusations from coast to coast. But Clinton was able to suppress everything, both from the public and the Republican Party, and the press helped him do it, because the press, mainly, is Marxist also. And it's obvious that this, this, <laughs> was the key to the Clinton election. Of course, with a little help of Pat Buchanan, H. Ross Perot, and the fact that George Bush didn't even run, after the Bilderberg Group in 1991 determined that William Clinton would be the next president of the United States. Now Clinton's spin doctors are trying to hide the facts about Whitewater from you. They are lying to you about the bankrupt savings and loan that Clinton and his cronies looted mercilessly to line their own pockets and further their political aims. They are lying to you about the Small Business Administration, which was defrauded for millions by Clinton and his cronies. As governor of Arkansas, Clinton created a tightly spun web of corruption. It is so complex, your mind will boggle at the connections. And over the next two nights, I will explain to you how it worked. Clinton regularly flew in the private plane of an influence peddler under investigation for drug dealing. He was later convicted for distributing cocaine. 
He gave the same man approval to sell hundreds of millions of dollars of Arkansas state bonds, even after he was under investigation for dealing drugs, and later when he was in prison, dealt with corrupt judges, paid off regulators, used political influence to keep an insolvent savings and loan open, forced at least one state agency to lease offices owned by a Clinton friend at a higher than market rate, and funneled state and crony legal business through Hillary, protecting his crimes with attorney-client privilege. The power and money he was able to acquire just from looting a poor state like Arkansas will send you reeling. Now he and his cronies, which even the press calls the Arkansas Mafia, have taken over the government of the United States of America. Clinton has become the most powerful public figure on earth. This man... This criminal must be stopped. That's why we're doing this series of programs. That's why Nick Guarino wrote his report. That's why many other people are digging into Whitewater, into Mena, Arkansas, into the depths of over 28 people closely associated with William Clinton, into the death of Vincent Foster, into the collapse of the savings and loan. Most newspapers and television news teams have not even touched this story. They merely skirt around it. When it was revealed that the Whitewater case was going before a grand jury, most newspapers buried the story if they covered it at all. Their liberal bias stops them from even beginning to look for the truth. Socialists have never been able to handle the truth, nor have they ever been mixed up in the truth. Nick Guarino spent the better part of 20 years in Arkansas. He ran a multi-million dollar business there, and he knows how business is done there. He played in the securities and brokerage businesses. He had millions of dollars invested in Arkansas banks and savings and loans. He invested heavily in Arkansas real estate. And he knew Bill Clinton, and he knew that Bill Clinton was corrupt. He also knew that Bill and Hillary would say when they discovered what he has released to the public, that he is an ex-convict fresh out of Leavenworth, and that's true. He was convicted of a white-collar crime, one count of mail fraud and one count of wire fraud. He claims that he was innocent, and he claims that he was railroaded, but folks, that is irrelevant. The more important point is that Nick Guarino knows what happened in Arkansas. He was incarcerated in Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, with others who were involved and who knew what happened in Arkansas. He has thousands of documents from various sources, including news media such as the Washington Times, New York Times, Washington Post, and other leading publications. Bill and Hillary will no doubt smear Nick Guarino and try to discredit him, but they will never sue him. You see, in a court of law, he can depose them and subpoena documents that they want no one to see. He knows where the skeletons are. He was locked up with people who had inside knowledge of Clinton's corruption. Some of them were top players in savings and loan real estate scams of the 1980s and in illegal battle. If necessary, Nick Guarino can open up the Clintons like a can of worms. I would love for him to do that, and I'm sure, I'm sure that it will probably come to that. You see, this was the greatest country in the world. Cooks like Clinton are selling us down the river. It makes us all sick, and Clinton has got to be stopped. Clinton and his cronies have made their denials. They've hidden their documents. They've silenced their witnesses, but it's not enough. Tonight... Tomorrow night and Friday night, I intend to bust the cover up wide open and expose the crimes Clinton has committed. The one thing they can't fight is the truth. Truth is the mightiest power in the universe, and it will destroy Bill Clinton. It is the wishes of Nick Guarino. It is the wishes 
of the American people who care deeply about this country. Whitewater is part of a scheme to hustle millions from banks and savings and loans. And from CAGI investigations, it goes directly to the Central Intelligence Agency, the Office of Naval Intelligence, and G2 Army Intelligence. The first thing that Nick Guarino wants you to understand about Whitewater is that the land was not the main scam. The real crime is the looting of banks, savings and loans, the Small Business Administration, and the Arkansas Development Finance Authority for millions of dollars by Bill Clinton and his cronies. Whitewater was just one of the vehicles they used to make this happen. For the most part, the scheme was a series of land and loan deals. It involved many of the political and business elite of Arkansas. Bill Clinton, who as governor was the most powerful person in the state, he held the power to grant or refuse business rights, appoint judges and other key public servants, and to hand out lucrative state contracts such as the bond deals for Dan Lassiter and the legal work to Hillary's law firm. He also controlled the purse strings of business in Arkansas through the Arkansas Development Finance Authority. Clinton received huge backdoor campaign contributions in return for political protection and other favors. James McDougall, former Clinton economic aide and the Clinton's partner in Whitewater. McDougall also was the co-owner of several other shady real estate ventures, and we'll tell you about that later. He was also the owner of the Kingston Bank and Madison Guarantee Savings and Loan. Clinton, McDougall, and other cronies looted Madison for millions. Steve Smith, another former aide and longtime Clinton friend. In 1978, Clinton, McDougall, and Smith decided real estate was Clinton's best bet for raising money because the governor would be less likely to have a conflict. Smith became president of the first bank Clinton tried to loot and was involved in several real estate schemes with Clinton cronies. He was recently subpoenaed in connection with Whitewater and Madison Guarantee. Jim Guy Tucker, Clinton's lieutenant governor and the current governor of Arkansas. Clinton hand-picked Tucker to succeed him. Tucker not only received a $1 million fraudulent loan from the SDA, but was also intimately involved in several of the real estate schemes. He was a partner in the Kingston Bank, which the FDIC slapped for giving out too many big loans to Clinton and his friends. Tucker is currently under investigation by the FBI and RTC. His records were recently subpoenaed. David Hale, a former Little Rock municipal judge appointed by Clinton. He made millions of dollars of fraudulent loans to Clinton's cronies through the Small Business Administration. At least one of the loans directly benefited Clinton. Hale says that Clinton pressured him to make the loans. Clinton says he can't recall this conversation. Hale is now under criminal indictment for defrauding the Small Business Administration. Seth Ward, the father-in-law of Hillary's law partner, Webster Hubble. Ward participated in some of the real estate ventures that went bust, approved a number of bad loans at Madison Guarantee as a director of the savings and loan, and defaulted on a $600,000 loan to the savings and loan himself. The federal government cited Ward's default as one of the worst abuses at Madison, but Hillary Clinton and her law firm, while representing the government, got the loan forgiven. Got the loan forgiven. David Lassiter, a millionaire businessman, gambler, and bond dealer. Lassiter's firm was a major source of brokered deposits to Madison, which was the major source of its explosive deposit growth. He donated huge amounts of money to Clinton's campaigns, paid off a drug debt for Clinton's brother Roger, took Bill on frequent trips in his private jet, and paid handsome legal bills to Hillary's firm. Clinton awarded Lassiter the lucrative license to sell Arkansas state bonds, even though he had been informed of Lassiter's corruption. Clinton continued to pass lucrative bond deals to Lassiter after the bond dealer was under investigation for distributing cocaine to friends and business associates. Later, in two separate cases, the regulators sought $3.3 million and then $4.6 million in damages from Lassiter. In both cases, ladies and gentlemen, Hillary got him off the hook for only $200,000 in the first suit and $250,000 in the second. The only problem? 
Hillary's firm didn't represent Lassiter. They represented the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. Did you hear that? Hillary's firm didn't represent Lassiter. They represented the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. And finally, Hillary Clinton herself. After Bill became governor, her earnings as an attorney skyrocketed from $30,000 a year to $400,000. She repeatedly represented both state and federal regulators against her own friends and clients. These were severe conflicts of interest that should have immediately disqualified Hillary, but she never disclosed them. Don't go away. I'll be right back. During the Clinton years, it was casino time in the Arkansas financial institutions. Anything went. The worst abuses took place at the savings and loans because they were more unregulated than banks, and not just in Arkansas. It was part of a well-planned destruction of the economy of the United States of America. First, hitting the unregulated savings and loans, and next is the unregulated banks. This drew unscrupulous business people looking for quick money. It also made savings and loans the favorite rating place for politicians. The politicians granted the state charters. They appointed the few regulators who did oversee the SNLs. And it's no accident so many politicians have turned to savings and loans for financing. The mess they created may end up costing us over $1 trillion. Whitewater was the first venture of this type by Bill Clinton. It is an early blueprint of a series of real estate ventures developed by Clinton cronies. They all involved huge loans from savings and loans and banks owned by Clinton's pals. On paper, all of them supposedly lost money. You'll soon see that the only people who lost money were the taxpayers. If you're a taxpayer, Clinton and the insiders took out fortunes. The way deals like this work, folks, is simple. First, you locate a piece of property. Let's say it's 100 acres worth $75,000. You then get one of your real estate friends to value it at $150,000. You borrow 80% of that from the savings and loan, where another of your friends is a director. Already, you've raised $120,000, which is 80% of $150,000, from a property worth only $75,000. You might make some minimal improvements, like dividing the property into lots and bulldozing a few roads through it. If you're smart, you get the state to pay for it. Now, you can say that $150,000 piece of property is worth $2.5 million, and that lets you borrow even more money. If you want still more cash, you just arrange a few sham sales at inflated prices to other friends. Since the value of your property has increased so dramatically, your friend at the savings and loan can then approve an even larger loan. One property that we looked into, for example, was run up from 75000 to almost $4 million in about a year. It's a giant, gigantic, incredible Ponzi scheme. Whitewater had many of these elements. First, it was in the middle of nowhere. Nick Guarino 
has stated that he wishes that he could show you this piece of property. It was almost totally uninhabited. Even 15 years after the Clintons bought the property, all there is to show for their development is a couple of mobile homes, a handful of fishing shacks, and a house or two. Indeed, the biggest amount of money spent improving the Whitewater property was a $150,000 road that stretched two miles through the forest. And guess what, dear sheeple? It was paid for by the state of Arkansas. The property was also mortgaged for far higher than its value. The Clintons and their partners purchased it with 100% borrowed money, nothing down. At times, lots were sold and resold without recording deeds, irregardless of the fact that they had been sold before. There are conflicting reports about profits and losses, and the money, dear listeners, has disappeared. Two other ventures Clinton cronies were involved in, Campo Bello and Castle Grande, worked even better than Whitewater, and you don't hear anything about these. They were purchased for a few hundred thousand, but the loans against them ran into the millions, and remember, I've already told you, the crux of the matter is not the real estate. You ain't heard nothing yet. These, Campobello and Castle Grande, were purchased for a few hundred thousand, but the loans against them ran into the tens of millions. And Bill and Hillary Clinton have stated, quote, We don't know anything about Whitewater, unquote. And P.T. Barnum said, and I quote, There's a sucker born every minute, unquote. Bill and Hillary claimed they were passive investors in Whitewater. They would have you believe they were innocent dupes in a series of unfortunate schemes perpetrated on them by unscrupulous cads. Nick Guarino and the Hour of the Time intend to demonstrate to you that the exact opposite is true. Number one, it was Bill Clinton himself who masterminded the schemes in connection with the intelligence community with its roots in the Central Intelligence Agency. Number two, Hillary, through her legal connections, was a key player in much of the fraud. And three, the Clintons and their friends benefited to the tune of millions of dollars. One thing you have to understand is that the political machine in Arkansas is one of the most corrupt systems in the nation. It's almost impossible to be in Arkansas politics and not be corrupt and it is heavily under the control of the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry of the Southern Jurisdiction. Now let me give you two examples of what we're talking about here. One Arkansas governor insured every concrete and steel bridge in the state for fire. Fire, mind you. Every concrete and steel bridge in the state for fire. Now who, dear listeners, do you think owned the insurance company? Another governor, up on fraud charges, fired the judge. He replaced him with the town drunk who promptly dismissed the grand jury that was about to hand down an indictment. Hallelujah, Arkansas. That's just politics as usual in Arkansas. Bill was just following in the footsteps of his illustrious predecessors. But you see, he had an extra incentive. The job of governor of Arkansas pays a dispiriting $35,000 a year. Clinton was not independently wealthy. He was a small-town boy with huge political ambitions. He was picked by the power structure. His mentor, his mentor was the man who wrote Tragedy and Hope. He was sent to England, to Oxford, under a Rhodes Scholarship to learn how to lead the sheeple into the new world order, into one world government. He's an Anglophile. He believes in British Israelism. He wanted to hobnob with the rich and the famous. And even with Hillary's law salary, he didn't have enough money. He needed cash, lots of it, and by the late 70s, he had already hatched a brilliant plan to raise money by taking it from someone else. And he was helped by the elite to dirty his hands. For in order to have their help to rise into power amongst those who call themselves illumined, 
You must be dirty, and they must hold the dirt. Madison Guarantee was pillaged to finance Whitewater and Clinton's mafia and to further the aims of the destruction of the United States of America, along with all the other savings and loans in this country. On paper, the Clintons and their partners, the McDougals, said they would convert this raw forest land into a vacation retirement community with dozens of lots. They said it would be a thriving new community. They bought white water with nothing down and then borrowed huge sums of money against it and funneled huge sums through it. First, they borrowed the 20000 down payment from Union Bank, which was later repaid with a new loan from Union Bank, taken out by Clinton Crony and present Arkansas Governor Jim Guy Tucker and McDougal. Then they borrowed another $183,000 from the Citizens Bank of Flippin. According to real estate agents and sales of neighboring property, the value of the land was supposed to be one-third of that, but by inflating the purchase price, you can borrow more against it. Later, Hillary got another $30,000 from Bank of Kingston using part of the same property that was already the collateral for the Flippin' Loan. Another $20,000 came from Security Bank of Paragould, which Bill used to pay off part of Hillary's loan. An additional $110,000 came from the diversion of an illegal SBA loan to McDougal's wife, so they had already borrowed $363,000 on property worth somewhere between $80,000 and $100,000. Later, indeterminate amounts appear to have been funneled into or through Whitewater from Madison and its shell companies. Around the time Whitewater development was formed, McDougal, along with other Clinton cronies, including Jim Guy Tucker, Arkansas's present governor, bought the Bank of Kingston. Steve Smith was appointed president. Within days of the purchase, McDougal, Tucker, and Smith began using the bank to finance Whitewater and Bill Clinton's political mafia. The bank loaned far more than the legal maximum credit limit to any one borrower. All the loans were going to prominent out-of-towners, political big shots who did not live in or around Kingston. Huge loans were going to Clinton cronies, including executives at major corporations like Walmart and Tyson Foods. Both Walmart and Tyson were large Clinton campaign contributors and recipients of juicy political favors. Hillary was on their board of directors. The solvency of the bank was threatened. It got so bad, ladies and gentlemen, that the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation began an investigation. In 1983, both Marlon Jackson, Arkansas State Banking Commissioner, and the FDIC demanded that Kingston stop making these loans. The FDIC said the loans threatened the stability of the bank. Clinton and his cronies were notified in writing and ordered to repay their loans. They then switched their scheme to savings and loans where the regulators couldn't get them. Soon after, McDougal bought Madison Guarantee Savings and Loan. Jackson, the regulator who stopped the loans to Clinton from Kingston, says he felt McDougal did this to escape the heavy regulation over the banks. The savings and loans were far less regulated. Quote, I've often thought that the reason he began using Madison Guarantee was because he had found that he couldn't do what he wanted with his bank, unquote, said Jackson. Madison was a tiny savings and loan in a tiny town. Its prospects looked dim, except Governor Clinton then intervened. He gave Madison approval to open a branch in Little Rock. This was highly prized among savings and loans. It meant Madison had instant access to a market that was literally a thousand times bigger. Later, Clinton sheltered Madison from regulatory scrutiny. Madison quickly became a large savings and loan, attracting $120 million in deposits. It did so by offering some of the highest interest rates to savers in the United States. You may recall the mid-1980s when Arkansas Savings and Loans sat on top of the list of highest interest-paying savings institutions. Madison was a leader in the race to attract the most deposits by offering high interest rates. It also began a series of fraudulent loan practices and deals with the political elite of Arkansas. Madison's furious expansion attracted federal regulators who stated in 1984 that Madison was in jeopardy from unsafe and unsound lending practices. 
According to the regulatory complaints, Madison made $17 million in loans to insiders, officers, and their family, and politically prominent Arkansas citizens, including Bill Clinton. Jim Guy Tucker received over $1 million. Steve Smith received at least $65,000. Seth Ward received at least $600,000. In most cases, these businesses eventually failed. But Bill Clinton and his cronies kept on getting more loans for bigger and better amounts. And again, as I said, the money disappeared. Where did it go? I would suggest, ladies and gentlemen, you look into Mena, Arkansas, and ask Ollie North. At times, tens of thousands of dollars were run through the Whitewater account at Madison in transactions that were apparently completely unrelated to Whitewater sales or expenses. Furthermore, huge overdrafts were mysteriously covered with deposits from various Madison subsidiaries and other McDougal corporations. Drug money. They used shell corporations to bury the transactions. The way they were able to do this was by using shell corporations, companies whose only purpose was to funnel funds out of the bank and into their pockets. These shell corporations were part of the focus of the RTC's first criminal referral, which named Clinton in 1992. The document outlines dozens of questionable loan transactions involving several Arkansas banks and 12 corporations affiliated with or doing business with Madison. Principals of the corporations include the Clintons, the McDougals, current Arkansas Governor Jim Guy Tucker, and other cronies. This document was suppressed by Clinton's machine during the presidential campaign. During the first half of 1985, Whitewater issued 10 checks for more than $70,000. Several were written to the bank of Cherry Valley, where Clinton had a campaign account. Unable to obtain the bank records, the RTC could not determine if the checks were deposited in the account. Five of the checks issued by Whitewater, totaling more than $60,000, were overdrafts that eventually were covered by funds from other alleged shell corporations or from Madison Financial Corporation, the SNL's wholly owned real estate subsidiary. One $30,000 check was issued on Whitewater's account to McDougal with a notation, quote, loan rate payment, unquote. Though the RTC found no records of any loan from McDougal. More money laundering. That check resulted in an overdraft that was covered by a deposit of $30,000 from Madison Financial Corporation. In April 1985, according to SNL documents, Madison Financial Corporation deposited $30,000 directly into Whitewater's account as a prepayment on a 1985 bonus to McDougal, Madison Financial Corporation's president. Some of the money that went through the alleged shell corporations to Whitewater came from bank loans. Those corporations were created legally, but appear to have no business purpose whatsoever. Clearly, they were established purely to funnel money out of the bank. More money laundering. At times, the purpose is blatant. Among the shell companies cited in the first referral were ventures named Tucker, Smith, McDougal. Smith, Tucker, McDougal, and a third named Smith, McDougal. Could anything, dear listeners, be a more obvious sham than that? Smith, McDougal, and Tucker were three of Clinton's aides and underlings. They, with Clinton as the obvious silent partner, hatched various sham real estate deals to raise money for Clinton. For example, the Castle Grandy trailer park to be near Little Rock was a grand scheme that ran up at least $2 million in loans, plus another million for a sewer plant to service the development. Nothing, nothing, nothing was ever developed. It's now an empty tract of land. There were no improvements. The land is littered with mattresses and old refrigerators. The land, according to some sources, is worth about $70,000. Where, where, where did the other $3 million go to? I suggest you look into Mena, Arkansas and ask Ollie North. Besides loans to Whitewater, the savings and loan funneled money to its owner's wife. One of the ways this was done was through a subsidiary, Madison Marketing. Madison Marketing handled $1.53 million of the thrift's business over a three-year period. The firm was owned by Susan McDougal, wife of the savings and loans owner. Her company apparently did no actual marketing for the bank. She merely collected commissions and borrowed money. 
According to the RTC, the evidence indicates that Madison Marketing was a sham company that performed no actual marketing services. They simply paid the bills of other firms and added their own 15% markup. In turn, Madison Marketing funneled money to Whitewater and to Clinton, and this is illegal. Madison funds were used to pay Clinton's past campaign debts. Madison employees were urged to donate money to Clinton. The SNL's officers told them the savings and loan would pay them back. Of course, it is illegal for savings and loan funds to be used in this manner. We will probably never know how much Clinton made from this. It had the potential to quickly reach tens of thousands of dollars and maybe millions. One thing that's known for sure, ladies and gentlemen, is that in 1985, at Clinton's request, Jim McDougal hosted a cocktail party at Madison headquarters to help Clinton pay off a $50,000 campaign debt. About $30,000 was raised. At least one of the listed donors denies ever writing a check. The donor was a 24-year-old college student. He supposedly gave $3,000. It later turned out that his father had signed the check, not he, and that it came from his father. Who was the father, ladies and gentlemen? A politician named Charles Peacock. Peacock at first told reporters he knew nothing about the check. Later, he admitted he had signed it in his son's name and told them simply, quote, I'm a politician, and as a politician I have the prerogative to lie whenever I want, unquote. Most of the records of these donations have disappeared. What few documents remain have convinced federal investigators that at least some of the money may have come directly from Madison. Many of the donations were in the form of Madison cashier checks, usually written in the name of an individual in his account. Three months before McDougal helped Clinton cover his debt, Clinton had appointed a new state regulator in charge of savings and loans. The appointee, handpicked by McDougal, turns out to have been a Little Rock lawyer who had previously represented McDougal's savings and loan. Bank investigators are also trying to find out what happened to an undisclosed amount of money that went directly from Madison to Whitewater. The Resolution Trust Corporation, a federal agency, has sent a whole package of criminal referrals to the Justice Department recommending further investigation into these donations. Good luck, as they are in the hands of the instigator of the Waco Massacre, Janet Reno. So far, no one has been able to piece together just how much Bill Clinton and his friends benefited from the diversion of funds from Madison and Whitewater. The transactions are muddled, and what documents haven't been destroyed are being withheld from the public, many of them by Janet Reno, the brains behind the murder of the congregation of Branch Davidian in Waco, Texas. But we know Madison failed in 1989 with a shortfall of 47 to $68 million. It was owned by Jim McDougal, Clinton's former aide, business partner, and fundraiser. Clinton knowingly kept the SNL open, using his political influence, and continued to give favors to McDougal. As McDougal put it, quote, Bill never turned me down on something I asked for, unquote. Furthermore, as you'll see in a moment, Hillary handled Madison's legal entanglements with the regulators. It was due to her and Bill's influence that Madison was not shut down when its insolvency was first discovered. The ties, ladies and gentlemen, are simply too close for coincidence. Much of the paper trail has been buried forever in what has been called atrocious record-keeping. But the evidence shows that Bill and Hillary, Billery and their cronies, were able to... Shut up, shut up. 
You're listening to The Hour of the Time. I'm William Cooper. You're listening to The Hour of the Time, and I'm too. <laughs> Thank you, baby. Well, folks, that was an entertaining Radio Freemasonry episode there. But unfortunately for them, our Kaji man in New Orleans kicked their butt. And when he started asking the right questions, pursuing the correct line... They were reduced to a bit, 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 a bit. I love it. I love it. Just absolutely love it. You keep listening to the hour of the time, and you'll know who killed John F. Kennedy, and you'll know who's trying to destroy all the sovereign nations of the world, and you'll know who's just trying to destroy all existing religions. You won't have any doubts in your mind whatsoever. And to our Kaji representative in New Orleans, well done, my friend. Well done. Okay, starting Monday, folks, we're going to be playing reruns every night while we move the studio. The studio is the last thing that we're moving. And uh, we've got to move it and set it up. We've also got to set up our television facilities. I don't know how long we're going to be doing reruns, but we're going to be playing the best of the hour of the time for as long as it takes to get all that stuff done. So, be patient, folks. And while we're doing that, we're going to keep the seeds open. People are really taking advantage of that seed offer. Remember, it's $48 for listeners, $40 for CAGI members, and... We're going to make something else available here. We're going to take the pantry unit. It's a three months supply for one person, or one and a half months for two people. Three months supply for one person, or one and a half months for two people. Dehydrated, nitrogen packed, and enameled cans. It's uh, four cases, 87 pounds shipping weight. And we're going to make that. $300 for listeners, $290 for CAGI members. The retail price is $380, folks. So that's $300 for listeners, $290 for CAGI members. The retail price is $380. We'll keep the seeds open, and we'll also make available the emergency unit, one month supply for one person. One month supply for one person. It's five cases. It uh, weighs 38 pounds. The retail price is $213. We'll make that $190 for listeners, $180 for CAGI members. Remember, these offers will be open the whole time that we're doing the reruns. I'll repeat it again tomorrow night. After that, it will not be repeated because it's not on the tapes that we're going to be playing, so write it down now, folks, and don't forget it. I'll try to repeat it later in the program, <clears throat> but uh, not right now. Just remember, folks, all this stuff about the CIA, the mafia, the Mossad, these are just smoke screens for the real people. Castro didn't do it. No, sir. It's the interlocking secret societies known collectively as the Illuminati that murdered John Fitzgerald Kennedy. All the symbolism is there. All the links are there. All the stone penises are there. Everything is there that you need to know. The Scottish Rite of Freemasonry, Southern Jurisdiction, B'nai B'rith, the ADL, which has links to the Mossad, the higher echelons of the Mafia, which was set up by Giuseppe Mazzini as an arm of the Illuminati, the Knights Templar, the Sovereign and Military Order, of the Knights of Malta, and I could go on and on and on, but those of you who have been listening to this program, you know what's happening, you know who's bringing it about, and you know what's going to come of it, and if we don't get smart and band together, and quit following these little smoke screens and chasing our tails around the park, folks. They're going to kick our ass. You understand what I'm telling you? So you better wake up.
Don't go away. I'll be right back. Was Rhodes Scholar Clinton or Country Bumpkin McDougal the mastermind uh, of Whitewater? Billery, that's Bill and Hillary, have tried to make it appear that James McDougal cooked up the Whitewater scheme and lured them into it. They claim they were passive investors. Come on, folks. Come on, Billery. You guys can do much better than that. If you just put your minds to it, can't you? McDougal is a country bumpkin with average brains and little education, a perfect patsy, and so far he fits the bill just right. Falls right into his niche, doesn't he? He's now broke and failing health and living on $750 a month in a broken-down apartment. Trying to tell me that this is the man who scammed hundreds of millions of dollars and he has nothing? Bill Clinton is a Rhodes Scholar, a graduate with honors from Georgetown University and a member of the Mensa Society. He's a multi-millionaire who has risen to the most powerful position in the world with the power elite of British Israelism and the Eastern Establishment behind him. Doesn't look like it, does it? But they are. See, if they weren't, he wouldn't be where he is today. He's famous ladies and gentlemen, for his deal-making, which means promising anything he has to to get his bills passed. So who do you think scammed who? And if you really think that Bill Clinton is the mastermind, you'd better think again. No king has ever really been the king. The Whitewater hustle came from the power behind William Clinton. William Clinton is the patsy, folks. The scheme was so blatant it's almost difficult to believe, which makes me, which makes me point to the fact that this was intended to dirty William Clinton so much that he could bring down the presidency and turn the American people against constitutional government. The Clintons put up no money for Whitewater. No money. They had no money. The money came from the real power and the real brains. They invested next to nothing, and even that was borrowed. Their losses are zero, folks. Forget the $68,900 loss they claim. We'll show you a bit later it's entirely a fabrication. And they're telling us McDougal, who used to be a Clinton aide, just gave them a 50% deal in a lucrative land investment for nothing. Just a little favor for a friend? Bullshit. Clinton put up no money, no time, no expertise, not a single contribution. That's not the real world, folks. In a legitimate project, you never take anyone on for free and give them 50% of their business. You put them in because they give you some benefit, or they buy it. But this was not a legitimate project, you see. The whole point of Whitewater and Clinton's and his cronies' other land loan deals was to milk the depositors and taxpayers of millions of dollars, all the while showing a loss or minimal income to the IRS and the public and to dirty Bill Clinton for what was to come later. The Clintons and their partners, the McDougals, operated Madison Guarantee as their personal piggy bank. They looted depositors' money to pay off Bill Clinton's personal campaign debts and to raise money for his campaign to become President of the United States. After stealing as much money as they could, Clinton and his partners watched as Whitewater went broke. It was the typical Florida swamp deal of the 30s. Nope. 
it was worse. And don't forget, folks, it didn't just happen here. It happened to savings and loans all across the United States as part of a very careful plan of milking money from the sheeple to finance drugs for arms to bring down this nation and other nations. The Clintons claim they lost $68,900 on Whitewater. If their former partner, James McDougall, and their real estate agent, Chris Wade, are to be believed, they didn't lose a penny. As McDougall put it, I put money into it. Money was owed me. I don't remember them putting anything in. Quote, I could sink it quicker than they could lie about it if I could get in a position so I wouldn't have my head beaten off, unquote, said McDougall. Quote, and Bill knows that, unquote. Why wasn't this so-called loss ever recorded on Bill and Hillary's income tax return? Bill says it was just an oversight. Well, that's very interesting. Coming from a man who took a $2 deduction for his used underwear donated to the Salvation Army. Hash marks and all. Hillary Clinton certainly didn't forget to take a $5,133 deduction for interest on a Whitewater loan she didn't even pay. What's more, the Clintons did list a $1,000 capital gain on their taxes for Whitewater. So what happened to the $68,000 they supposedly lost? Why wasn't that on there? Because they knew that that would ring bells. Between 1978 and 1982, Whitewater generated sales of almost $300,000. Where did all that money go, dear sheeple? Even their real estate agent, Chris Wade, can't understand the $68,900 loss. Wade says, quote, I don't see where they could have lost money, unquote. He also said that Whitewater appeared to generate enough income from land sales to cover its expenses and that he regularly deposited money from lot payments into Whitewater's account. Hidden profits? Laundered money? Disappearing cash? Fraud and deceit appear to permeate every event in the Whitewater Clinton saga, and in fact, Clinton's whole life. Consider an early sale of a Whitewater lot in 1980. The property in question was their prime lot, 28 acres overlooking the White River. The Clintons and the McDougalls supposedly paid $882.61 per acre for this property, three times what it was worth, according to one real estate expert, which works out to $24,713.08. But when they sold the lot to real estate agent Chris Wade in 1980, they recorded a $2,000 price for the entire 28 acres on the tax stamps. Wade says he paid $32,000 for the property. He resold it to a Texas couple for about $43,000. By the Clintons' reckoning, the net on the transaction works out to a $22,713.08 loss. But if Wade is telling the truth, and the numbers certainly seem to bear him out more than Billery, the Clintons made a $7,280 profit. Where did that money go? A few years later, Wade was involved in another unusual transaction with the Clintons and McDougalls. He wanted to buy Whitewater's 24 remaining lots, but he did not have cash. Quote, I had an airplane and no money, and they had the lots. Unquote, Wade said. He ended up giving the plane to McDougall and assuming $35,000 of Whitewater's $100,000 debt. McDougall sold the plane to Seth Ward, who turned around and sold it back to one of McDougall's shell companies, which in turn borrowed the money from Madison, and McDougall pocketed the proceeds. Billery, let me see if we've got this right. Let me see. Let me just sort of check this out here. Let's talk about this and see how it sounds. Bill and Hillary, you buy a piece of property. The bank lends you more than it's worth. You claim you sold off all the best lots for 10 cents on the dollar and the worst lots for 35 cents on the dollar, while your real estate agent is saying you had $300,000 in sales 
Of course, you don't keep track of any of the transactions. You don't record the deeds with the courthouse, and the deeds disappear. You can't find the checks that paid the interest on the loans. Your accounts on the project had possibly one million dollars or more run through them over a ten-year period, but let me see. Oh, oh, that's right. You say the money's gone, and you don't have it. Hmm. How is this possible? No, folks, the numbers don't add up. It doesn't make any sense. That money went somewhere, and Bill, Hillary, and their cronies, and others, unnamed, were the beneficiaries. If you could follow the money, if you could follow the money, a lot of it you could follow directly to the Drugs for Guns operation run by Ollie North and others, and to the Central Intelligence Agency. Hillary was a key player in Bill's schemes. Hillary Clinton claims she has no knowledge of the savings and loans in McDougal's handling of Whitewater. <laughs> You're going to love this part, folks. But McDougal says it was always Hillary he contacted to discuss the development. And there are allegations that she had power of attorney, quote, to manage and conduct all matters, unquote, related to Whitewater. She was personally retained by the savings and loan as their attorney, represented them before state regulators, and she was on a $2,000 a month retainer to Madison. But she says, she says she has no knowledge of the savings and loans in McDougal's handling of Whitewater. Mm-hmm. And Santa Claus is coming back tomorrow. Hillary was a senior partner in the biggest, most prestigious law firm in Arkansas. She got the job when Bill became governor. And from that time on, Clinton funneled huge amounts of state legal work through her firm. For example, her firm got much of the lucrative legal work for the issuance of state bonds that benefited many of their clients. They got the legal work from Madison. They represented the regulators, even against some of their own clients, and they handled the legal work for Lassiter's Bond Company, all unethical, all illegal all criminal, all, in fact, felonies. If you wanted to do business with the state of Arkansas, it was no longer necessary to make payoffs with $100 bills and paper bags. You just went and retained Hillary Clinton. The money you paid the Clintons to do a government deal was no longer an illegal payoff, but a legal bill. Even better, it's protected under attorney-client privilege, and you can't get better than that. The benefits of retaining Hillary were often ends to the most lucrative government deals, such as the Arkansas development bond issues. Over the decade Bill was governor, Hillary became a multi-millionaire, and it's no wonder. Little partner in a law firm. And how did Hillary and Bill keep regulators from closing an insolvent savings and loan? Well, let's look at that, folks. The regulators knew that Madison Guarantee Savings and Loan was insolvent as far back as 1985. But Bill and Hillary used their political influence to keep the Madison open, and they succeeded for years. After all, the regulators were appointed by Governor Bill Clinton, who was their boss. They did the right thing to keep their jobs. They backed off. What some people won't do. For a piddly ass little job that don't pay anything, they'll sell their whole country down the drain. All their neighbors and friends, people who invested, had their savings in there. But these regulators didn't care. They wanted to keep their little old stinking job. Probably got paid $20,000 a year, which ain't chump change in this day and age, folks. I hope that doesn't insult too many of you, but it's true. It's absolutely true. I never could figure out why people consent to be the slave of somebody else working for chump chain when they have the same brain as everybody else who uses their brain. Who's the boss? Who create companies who employ other people? How about that? A 1986 audit by the Federal Home Loan Bank Board, FHLBB, portrays Madison as financially reckless, rife with conflicts and on the brink of collapse. As they put it, folks, quote, the problems discussed in this report, con conflicts of interest, 
high-risk land developments, poor asset quality, rapid growth, inadequate income and net worth, low liquidity, security speculation, excessive compensation, and poor records and controls <laughs> constitute a significant threat to the continued existence of the institution, unquote. My, my. Furthermore, regulators noted that at least 17 million had been loaned out to friends and family at McDougal, who, along with Clinton and his cronies, used Madison as their personal piggy bank. Of course, they all deny any participation or knowledge of this now, and all claim that they don't have the money. Meanwhile, Hillary Clinton was claiming to regulators that the savings and loan was solvent, yet she claimed she never knew anything about the savings and loan. But it's on record. She even put together a stock offering, which the state of Arkansas approved to bring in millions of new suckers' dollars in this socialist Marxist twit. Has you all convinced that she's for the poor person and she's going to elevate your lifestyle and make you all happy participants in the new world order? The new socialist state. Haven't you caught on yet? Marxists always promise you the moon and steal your underpants. And she's a screaming Marxist. In essence, Hillary was proposing that the people of Arkansas be convinced to use their hard-earned money to shore up an insolvent savings and loan. The woman who claimed she didn't know anything about the savings and loan. The scheme was so outrageous that even Hillary couldn't sneak it by the FHLBB who killed the deal and it's on record. Four years later, the federal government called the plan Hillary tried to push through fraudulent. But do you think that they prosecuted her? No. If this was you or me, if this was you or me, where would we be right now? Why, we'd be in cell block C. And Clinton became president of the United States. And then there's the little matter of Madison's $2,000 a month payoff to Hillary. Madison guarantee that Hillary knew nothing about. Her husband was governor of Arkansas. She worked for the biggest, most prestigious law firm in the state. Oh, we said that, didn't we? Hillary was the ideal conduit for political favors and payoffs. When Bill did a favor for someone... The payback could go to Hillary. When the state needed outside legal representation, the work could go to Hillary's firm, and millions of dollars were funneled through her law firm. Madison guarantees savings and loan is just one example. According to James McDougall, early one morning about nine years ago, he answered a knock at his office door, and he found a winded and sweating Bill Clinton dressed for a jog on the steps. Clinton was then struggling to retire campaign debts for his gubernatorial run and to make ends meet on his $35,000 salary. The governor expressed concerns about his family's financial condition. He told McDougal things were tight and asked him to send some business to Hillary through her law firm. Quote, I asked Clinton how much he needed, says McDougal, unquote, and Clinton said, quote, about $2,000 a month, unquote. Later that day, McDougal directed an executive at Madison to immediately put Hillary Clinton of the Rose Law Firm on retainer for that amount. Quote, I hired Hillary Clinton because Bill came in whimpering that he needed help, said McDougal. The bank said he had no specific legal work in mind when he hired Hillary, unquote. McDougal said he recalled the event vividly because he was so uncomfortable during the meeting, not over the retainer issue, but because throughout the conference, Clinton sat sweating at McDougal's new leather desk chair, an expensive gift from his wife. Ain't being rich tough, folks. The house that Hillary built. It was Hillary who built the first model home in Whitewater. Although the land was already mortgaged by Whitewater through the Citizens Bank of Flippin, Hillary took out a $30,000 personal loan from the Bank of Kingston, also controlled by McDougal, putting nothing down. 
McDougal couldn't borrow the money because being an owner of the bank, it would arouse suspicions among the regulators. Whitewater Development Corporation could not borrow the money itself because its only asset, the land, was pledged as collateral for the current loans. But Hillary, oh yes, Hillary was able to get the loan and pledge it to Whitewater, which then paid the interest and the principal. The banking commissioner in Arkansas has said this loan violated state laws, and probably federal laws as well, although Whitewater was paying the loan off and Hillary had never paid Whitewater for the lot. She built the model home and then sold it at least twice, folks. She sold this thing twice. One source suggests more. Whitewater essentially gave her the property. She paid no taxes on this gift, but she did take the interest payments off on her income tax to the tune of $5,133. The Clintons claimed this was a mistake, but since the statute of limitations is long past, Billery say they are not required to pay it. And why am I talking about all these taxes that they paid or didn't pay? Simply, folks, they have declared that they are taxpayers, and since they volunteered, they're obligated to pay it. At one point, she appears to have sold the property two days before she had bought it back from the last sale. Investigators haven't been able to track the profits on these sales. Oh, no. You see, the records were lost. You try that. The sales were done on unrecorded contracts. Not only were the records lost, but the contracts were unrecorded. The deeds were not recorded with the courthouse, and the deeds have disappeared. So there's no place regulators can go to get a reliable record of the transactions. All we have is the Clinton's word. And try selling that property today. It's a title company's nightmare. Try to get title insurance on something that's been through that kind of a mill. Some pieces of property being sold two or three or four times. Madison guarantees fast and loose loans to Bill Clinton and his cronies could never have gone on as long as they did without Hillary. The bank examiners got on to Madison as early as 1984. They discovered the insider loans to Clinton's and his political cronies, as well as family and friends of McDougal. In fact, a 1996 report by the Federal Home Loan Board painted a grim picture of Madison's prospects it detailed what it said were widespread abuses by the thrift and risky land deals for which the economic justification is questionable. The viability of the institution is jeopardized through the institution's current investment and lending practices in real estate development projects. Ho, 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 ho. Oh, these bureaucrats can sure come up with words, can't they? But Bill and Hillary used their political leverage to keep the state regulators away, and it wasn't until four years after the first signs of impending collapse that state regulators closed the operation finally. At a loss, dear listeners, to taxpayers of 47 to $68 million, and since everything's missing, that's a guess. Hillary represented Madison through her law firm. It was her firm that presented a rosy picture of the savings and loans prospects to the regulators. She then put together a bailout plan. It was a stock offering to bring in millions of new suckers' dollars and recapitalize the savings and loan they were looking for sheeple. Hillary's plan was reviewed by Securities Commissioner Barbara Bassett Schaefer, a Clinton appointee. Mrs. Schaefer had been on the job for three months. Before her appointment, she had been an attorney at a firm that represented Madison. She'd even done a small amount of legal work herself for the SNL. McDougal says she was his choice to fill the spot. They were trolling for sheeple, and the sheeple were biting. <laughs> The 
despite Madison's terrible financial condition, Mrs. Schaefer approved Hillary's plans. Fortunately, it never went through. Madison could not come up with the capital to get it past the feds. Otherwise, thanks to Hillary, Madison could have lost millions more. It was at this time that Mrs. Clinton apparently also became involved with bank examiner Sarah J. Warsham. Mrs. Warsham had written a devastating report on Madison that could have shut the thrift down. In her January 1984 report to the Federal Home Loan Bank Board, she said Madison had engaged in, quote, unsound lending practices, unquote, and had improperly booked profits. What an understatement. With a report like this, she could have shut Madison down, but she didn't. Oh, no. According to the Washington Times, within months of the report, Madison hired Mrs. Warsham under her maiden name of Hawkins as a senior vice president at $65,000 a year. In addition, she got a $5,000 unsecured loan, a $500 a month expense account, and yearly bonuses of $2,000 plus, dear sheeple, a Rolls Royce Bentley sedan to just tool around town and cruise down to the Sonic Drive-In in my roles. Yes, sir. And Bill Clinton says, Enough of this whitewater stuff. It's taking me away from the important business of running the nation. Don't you mean ripping off the nation, Bill? Just like you ripped off Arkansas? Don't you mean destroying the nation, destroying the presidency, destroying the credibility of constitutional government? Don't you mean, Bill, destroying the faith of Americans in constitutional government, in freedom? Isn't that what you really mean, Bill? When regulators finally closed Madison in 1989, the Resolution Trust Corporation, the federal agency responsible for cleaning up the savings and loan scams of the 80s, took over the mess. The RTC sued Frost & Company, the Madison accounting firm, for negligence in conducting its audits. One of Hillary's partners, Vince Foster, yes, the Vince Foster folks, solicited the case from the RTC. But he failed to disclose Hillary's representation of Madison. He even submitted a letter to the regulators saying the law firm didn't represent thrifts. The law firm didn't represent thrifts. The law firm didn't represent thrifts. And Hillary Clinton says she don't know nothing about no SNLs. Uh-uh. A clear conflict of interest. But Hillary's law firm got the case. Hillary's law firm got the case. A third partner, Webster Hubble, handled the case along with Hillary. The government sought up to $60 million in its suit. Hillary's law firm settled the case for $1 million, $2 million less than the limit of Frost's insurance coverage, so it cost Frost and company nothing. This was after Hillary had been on retainer to Madison for many months. In addition, Hubble's father-in-law, Seth Ward, was an officer of a Madison real estate subsidiary at the time they agreed to handle the case. Much of this was dug up by Nick Guerma. Ward was a director of Madison and approved many of the loans to Clinton cronies. He was also the recipient of a $600,000 loan from Madison, which was still owed at the time Madison was closed. The RTC considered his loan one of the worst examples of abuse at the savings and loan, but Hillary personally got the government to forgive it. Hillary got the government to forgive it. Hillary's law firm received $400,000 from the government for handling this case. The government, which was seeking up to $60 million, essentially got nothing. Out of the $1 million settlement, $400,000 went to Hillary's law firm, and a $600,000 loan to Seth Ward was forgiven. <laughs> oh, ain't socialism great, folks? Don't you just love it? wish Karl Marx was here. He'd be rolling on the floor, laughing, holding his belly. Hubble, the partner who handled most of the Frost suit, was later appointed by Bill Clinton as the number three person in the Justice Department. Justice. 
just us. Just us. Just us. And we ain't included in that us, folks. Questions about Hillary's conflicts of interest don't stop at her work with the Rose Law Firm, for she has been caught red-handed in what clearly seems to be an insider trading scheme. As we all know, Hillary is so concerned about mankind and sick people, all socialists are, they want to help the poor, the sick, the bleeding, the homeless, that without any direct compensation or reward, she has given her very valuable time to fix the health care system in America. I wonder how many of her cronies will benefit from that. As head of the health task force, Hillary made crucial decisions about the future of health care in America. The plan was developed secretly because Hillary couldn't have made her backroom deals if it was public. The Clintons are still resisting making the health task force documents public, especially the documents that reveal conflicts of interest among task members. Now, it turns out that while heading this task force, Hillary was part of a partnership that made its profits selling health stocks short. In other words, folks, capitalizing on downward moves in the stocks. Hillary had as much as $100,000 in a hedge fund called Value Partners One, which is based in Little Rock. Evidently, she was impressed when she read about Ivan Bosky. Most funds with short-selling strategies were hammered in 93 because of the stock market boom, but stocks in the healthcare fields plunged dramatically. The total value of stocks in pharmaceuticals, medical hardware, biotech, and health insurance fell 200 billion, that's billion with a B, largely as a result of Hillary's health care plans. Let me say that again, folks. Stock in pharmaceuticals, medical hardware, biotech, health insurance, nursing homes, etc. fell $200 billion, largely as a result of Hillary's health care plans, and she had sold these stocks short. Do you understand what I'm saying? I know many of you probably don't, but some of you do. Hillary's statements about health care directly affected the prices of these stocks on a daily basis. Now, do you really think she didn't know this? She was an attorney with 15 years legal experience. She played the stock market. She knew the impact her statements would have on the market. And there she was investing on the swings her press releases caused selling health care stock short. Although the press has been careful to talk in terms like conflict of interest, it's a clear case of insider trading. It's a felony. The White House isn't denying Hillary had a conflict of interest. They just say the conflict of interest statutes don't apply to Hillary. Her finances are commingled with bills, and as president, he is exempt from those laws. They don't call him Slick Willie for nothing. The only formal legal opinion on the subject drafted in the 80s declared that the conflict laws don't apply to wives of presidents because spouses aren't federal employees. Now, that might seem to get Hillary off the hook, but it doesn't. You see, when she was heading the task force, there was a lawsuit demanding that the meetings be opened to the public. The Federal Advisory Committee Act says such meetings can be closed only if attended by full-time employees of the government. As an employee, she had to be paid. How much was she paid, and where is the evidence? The lawsuit was resolved, determining that Hillary was indeed a full-time government employee, and the public was told that she was a volunteer. So Hillary is not exempt. Her own testimony, she says, she was an employee of the government. Therefore, she was in a conflict of interest. But that's not even the main point. Hillary Clinton manipulated share prices and traded on those manipulations. On Wall Street, you'd go to jail for that. On Capitol Hill, it ought to be the same. Madison Guarantee was not the only institution. Hillary and Bill Clinton and his cronies looted. 
Capital Management Corporation, which issued small business administration loans, was another prime target. David Hale, a municipal judge who was appointed by Bill Clinton, made the loans. According to Hale, Bill Clinton directly pressured him to make SBA loans for $300,000 to Mrs. McDougal, his partner's wife. Clinton also probably pressured Hale to loan $1 million to Guy Tucker, the present governor of Arkansas. <laughs> and here we go again. One more time on the merry-go-round, folks. These loans were supposed to go to socially disadvantaged businesses. Instead, they went to the multi-millionaire wife of Clinton's business partner and Clinton's lieutenant governor. At least $110,000 of Mrs. McDougal's SBA loan went into Whitewater. Clinton's spokesman, James Lynch, now says that was a private loan from Mrs. McDougal to Whitewater, and that to suggest there was any impropriety is ridiculous. But even Jim McDougal admits the SBA loans to his wife were a scam. David Hale was the official who made these SBA loans. He says they all knew he was submitting fraudulent financial statements. He says Clinton and McDougal told him the loan was made out in Mrs. McDougal's name only because she was a woman and would therefore qualify as a minority. Folks, if women are a minority, what's going to happen to the future of the human race? Where do they get this bullshit from and they're wheeling it around in wheelbarrows and dropping it out of the sky. Hale says he never even met Mrs. McDougal until she came to sign the papers and pick up the check. Mrs. McDougal, who is now under indictment for cashing $150,000 worth of stolen checks, claims to know nothing of the loan. Women are minorities. No wonder these Aryans are so upset thinking their race is going to become extinct. They can't find any women. They're minorities. All this baffles me, folks. What do I know? I'm just a crazy conspiracy nut. I'm paranoid. <laughs> Oh, let me see. I wish my friend was here, the one that sent me the tapes. This is one of those nights I'd like to go off and sit on the mountain and talk to him. Indeed, Hale says, McDougal told him the $300,000 would not be used by the designated borrower, Mrs. McDougal. Instead, he said, it would conceal questionable transactions by Madison, including help for the Clintons. Hale says Clinton met twice with him about the loan, once telling him the Clinton name could not be associated with the deal anywhere in this, anywhere at all. He also said all three, McDougal, Clinton, and he, knew Mrs. McDougal did not legally qualify for the SBA loan. Three months earlier, the McDougals had filed a financial statement showing assets of $3.1 million and net worth of $2.2 million. Quote, I knew what was going on, as we all did, Hale said, but we were friends, and that's just the way business is done in Arkansas, unquote. And guess what, dear sheeple? Of course, the money was never, ever paid back, even though Mrs. McDougal is a millionaire. <laughs> Hale is now up for criminal prosecution. He says Clinton pressured him to make the fraudulent loans. U.S. Attorney Fletcher Jackson, who oversaw Hale's indictment, refused to conduct an investigation or even listen to Hale about Clinton's involvement. Hale says Jackson told him he didn't want to know anything about Clinton or Tucker because he had eight years to retirement and was not looking to do anything to jeopardize it, unquote. Jackson later confirmed this conversation. As with Whitewater and Madison Guarantee, it was real estate that allowed Clinton and his friends to loot the SBA. You see, Whitewater was only one of the land scams invented to loot the savings and loans in banks, and not just in Arkansas, but all over the nation. Clinton appears to have connections to several such deals that involved millions in loans from Madison Guarantee and Capital Management Corporation, which issued the SBA guaranteed loans. In Texas, a man by the name of George Green was pulling the same scams in Texas as Clinton was pulling in Arkansas. And when they... 
started to tie the hangman's noose to hoist George Green up by the nearest tree, he fled Texas and started publishing the Phoenix Journals. <laughs> oh, poor sheeple. Poor, poor sheeple. You're in big trouble and you don't even know that you're in trouble. By this time, Bill Clinton's name was no longer appearing on documents, but although his name does not appear on any of the later real estate deals, the owners that are named are the very same good old boys that appear over and over and over in all the Clinton scandals throughout the years. One such property was Castle Grande, a 1,100-acre swamp which was proposed to become a trailer park. I thought you all learned your lessons in Florida. It was owned by Jim Guy Tucker, who succeeded Clinton as governor, Steve Smith, Clinton's former aide, Seth Ward, father-in-law of one of Hillary's law partners, and other powerful Arkansas political and business figures. Like Whitewater, the project showed a loss on paper. Like Whitewater, it was financed with loans far surpassing the value of the property. Like Whitewater, Castle Grande was plagued by questionable agreements involving prominent Arkansas political figures. It finally went under with more than $3 million in loans paid for by the American taxpayer. Who, by the way, doesn't even have to pay those taxes at all. Hi, Chihuahua. Castle Grandy and related projects, including South Loop Construction, a 30-acre parcel for a shopping center next to Castle Grandy, and Castle Sewer and Water, which was to provide some utility services to the development, borrowed millions from Madison and the SBA. The original property was purchased by Tucker, Smith, and Ward for $125,000. Tucker borrowed $260,000 from Madison to pay for it and diverted the rest of the money to other projects. Ward borrowed $600,000 from Madison to invest in the project, which he later defaulted on, and which Hillary arranged to have forgiven when she was representing the government. Yes, sir. When she was representing the government. Two years later, a company then controlled by Tucker South Loop Construction purchased the property, this time for $353,000. Did you get that? Tucker is selling the property from one of his companies to another. The additional money for the purchase came from David Hale's Capital Management Corporation, which issued a $150,000 SBA loan. Tucker never repaid the SBA loan. Last spring, however, when bank regulators started turning the heat on under Madison, he rushed out and paid the original $260,000 loan. He got scared. In addition, Tucker purchased Castle Water and Sewer Corporation from Madison's real estate subsidiary. Madison financed the Tucker purchase with a $1,050,000 mortgage. Hale's company put in an additional $150,000 SBA loan. A year later, only one year later, Castle Grandy stalled with only a few home lots that were ever sold, and there never was any marketing done. One bank examiner called the Castle Grande property, quote, low and swampy, unquote, and said it, quote, could not be developed without considerable cost. There is no evidence that there is a viable market for this land, unquote. Today, the land is littered with old armchairs and carpet. There's nothing to show for the millions looted from Madison and the Small Business Administration. Bank regulators have found a trail of shell corporations, fictitious transactions, exactly like George Green did in Texas and others did in other states across the nation. They're all the same scams, all run from the headquarters of the Central Intelligence Agency in Langley, Virginia. What for? Why, to buy arms. For which to pay for drugs with which to bring down the United States of America. That's what for.
shell corporations, fictitious transactions, inflated profit statements, and questionable payments to insiders, including Bill Clinton. Castle Grandy is now included in a list of projects involving possible criminal conduct that's being presented before a special grand jury convened in Little Rock. George Bush's boys were involved in all of this also. But it was the political connections in the Castle Grandy project financed by Madison that finally led the Justice Department to take control of what had been treated previously as a routine local investment. By this time, McDougall had been ousted from Madison by regulators, but his slot was quickly filled by another good old boy, Steve Kaufman, one of Tucker's former law associates. And Kaufman promptly forgave half of Tucker's $1,050,000 debt. The deal resulted in one of Madison's largest losses. William Seidman, former chairman of the FDIC, said the Castle Grande deal mirrored the type of risky ventures that helped bring many SNLs down during the mid-1980s. Quote, it has all the connotations of those things, Seidman said. On its face, you would say the transaction looks like not a real transaction, unquote. Why don't you just say it? Why don't you just say it, Seidman? They're crooks. And it was a scam. Another project, Campo Bello, Campo Bello, Shades of Eleanor Roosevelt, Shades of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Another well-known socialist. Another project, Campo Bello, was to develop 343 acres in West Little Rock and 3,900 acres on Campobello Island off the shores of Nova Scotia, Canada. This one was run by James McDougall, owner of Madison Guarantee, and Chris Wade, the real estate agent who was involved in Whitewater. This project went bust just like the others, same players, same scam, same disappearing records, disappearing money, disappearing deeds, disappearing everything. One of Madison's lawyers, Beverly Bassett, from Mitchell Law Firm, was key to seeking approval for Campobello from the State Securities Department. Interestingly enough, Jim Guy Tucker was a senior partner at the same law firm. And this project ultimately became Madison's biggest loser, with $3.7 million in loans outstanding. This is how savings and loan after savings and loan has been looted around the country. And it's not because all of these people in different states and different cities all thought of the same plan at the same time. It's because it was orchestrated. It starts out with a piece of marginal property. The insiders bid it up rapidly in sham sales and then use it as collateral for huge loans. Anything of real value is sold off. All the money is missing and no one knows where it went. The project goes broke, leaving huge loan indebtedness against it, paid for by the taxpayers. As with Whitewater, the Castle Grande and Campobello land losses were terrible, despicable, but they are not the major issue here. It is the fraudulently obtained loans, particularly those that were never repaid. It's the disappearing money. Clinton's cronies used these land schemes to make millions 